Hi, and welcome back to ENTP Life. In today's video, we're gonna be going over hard money lenders and which hard money lenders I use and why you should be using hard money lenders to do your real estate investing. Now, if you're not already a subscriber, please take that time out now. Hit that subscription down to the uh, right side of the screen. Make sure you turn that notification bell on because if the notification bell is on, you get alerted right away when I drop new content. Now, as I always say, remember, hit that like button because that tells the YouTube algorithm that you are interested in my content, it helps me rank a little bit better, and allows more people to see this valuable content and allows more people to participate in investing in real estate and improving their businesses overall. So what is hard money lending? Hard money lending is really the practice of participating in direct lending to individuals, usually related to an asset or uh, small business financing. Now, for a long time, a lot of people associate hard money with high interest loans, which is actually factual. They're, they're taking riskier loans with less underwriting rules and really giving you an infusion of cash for whatever your desired outcome may be. Now, when I first learned about hard money lenders, it was probably around 2007. And at the time, lending was coming pretty easy. So that was like the last option for people who had absolutely dead credit and wanted to invest in real estate. And really, it, it, there wasn't a, a good place for it because you could get money so easily in those days. Once the real estate market dried up and, and lending dried up, hard money lenders really stepped in in a big way to provide financing, especially for those people who were participating in the acquisition of these short sales and, and REOs that were hitting the market in bulk. 2008, 2009, 2010, you had a lot of properties coming online as foreclosures and there was really no lending options and that's where hard money really started to take a foothold. Now, the hard money lenders that I use, I'm gonna insert like a link above somewhere to just uh, you know kind of allow you to circle back to them, is asset-based lending. They're based out of Hoboken, New York, really outstanding group of guys, and I'll tell you a little story about them. I'm also gonna link uh, asset-based lending down below in the description, so you'll be able to find it throughout the length of the video once that card up top disappears. Now, ABL, as they often refer to themselves, are uh, asset-based lenders. They are hard money lenders and they were actually the first lenders that I ever used and the first lenders to ever finance me when I got started in this flipping real estate business. Prior to using ABL, I had to use more conventional uh, mortgages that were available at the time, whether it was an FHA 203K mortgage or mortgages that were available back in the day. Um, but since then, uh, I've been working with ABL and, and the relationship has been really good. And there's been a lot of changes with their loan program over the years. Now, asset-based lending was founded by uh, two guys, uh, Dan and Paul, and they had been involved in the trading of mortgage securities before the crisis. Now, after the crisis hit, they turned around and said, well, you know, it might make sense uh, for us to get into the other side of these transactions and start financing people who are going to be buying these distressed assets because their fund had blown up and it just, you know, it, it didn't make sense to be trading mortgage securities at the time. So they took the money that they had and started this fund for hard money lending. Um, I called them, I can't even remember what year it was that we started. I, I'd like to think it was 2012, but it might've been 2015. I really, I can't, I can't remember, but I think it was 2012. Um, I went to this conference and I think they were sponsors of the conference. They had like a little uh, ad in the back of this booklet. And it was, a, it was a conference for investors and people who were trying to raise money or people who were uh, trying to lend money, I guess. They might've been there trying to raise money for their fund. So I reached out to them and I was looking at these deals in Harlem, which, which really makes me think it was 2012. And I told them, I said, I'm looking at this deal, it was $800,000 brownstone needed around 400K of renovations. That was a total deal of 1.2 million. And I anticipated that I'd be able to get out at like 1.6, 1.7. So the funny thing is when I reached out to them, the first person I spoke to was Dan. And Dan said, um, you know, that, that deal sounds interesting, but we currently have $4 million under management. If we were to invest a million dollars or, or even $1.2 million into your deal and your deal were the tank, you would pretty much tank our fund. So, you know, as interesting as this is, this is not a deal that we would find because that's not where we are right now. 
Fast forward to 2020, they have over $100 million in assets and a deal like that would be a drop in the bucket, right? So it just shows you how with, with continuity and, and keeping up with whatever business that you're working on, you're gonna eventually get to a size where you know, you'd be satisfied with where you are. So that's just a funny tidbit about that, that deal. So that Harlem deal never happened. So I was like, well, you know what? I do want to find a deal that, that they will finance. And I ended up finding a deal in Bayshore, New York that kind of uh, worked out. Now, when I brought this deal to them, I started asking them exactly how will the deal be processed, et cetera. So at the time they were lending 65, up to 65% of the loan uh, of the after repair value of that property. So that means if you, uh, if the property was worth $200,000 when it was fully renovated and ready to be flipped, they would lend $130,000 as the maximum. So that would be the most that they would lend. And what they would do is require you to be in the purchase of that deal for at least 20%. So if you were buying a house for, I don't know, $130,000, for instance, uh, they would expect you to come up with at least $26,000 for the purchase price. And then they would come up with the rest for the, for the home. So $26,000 would come out of your pocket and they would finance the other $104,000. But remember, if this property was only going to be worth $200,000, they would only allow you to borrow an additional $24,000 for the renovations, right? Because they want you to be in this deal for or they want to be in this deal for less than 65% of the after repair value. The reason for that is because they need to have some safety in that if you were to drop the ball on this deal, they would be able to repossess the house and flip it to another investor without really taking on too much risk or loss in that transaction, right? So that was part of the parameters. And also by having that 35% spread, it makes it really satisfying for the investor um, as far as the return is concerned. Because if, if a property is worth 200,000 and your total debt obligation is 65%, then you have the potential to make, there's a $70,000 spread there. Obviously some of it's gonna be your initial investment, but there's gonna be $70,000 to play with. After your carrying cost, after your buy side fees, after your sell side fees, you're gonna lose anywhere close to like another 10 to even 15% on just transactional stuff. So if you add the 15% to the 65, there's a 20% spread for you. And they kind of want to make sure that there's enough room in the deal, at least at that time, that there was enough money for you to make in that deal, right? Or else it, it wouldn't be worth it and you might have a greater chance of walking away from the deal and now they're, they're dealing with you know, a mess on their hands. So those were the early parameters. Another thing was that they were doing for new investors with bad credit, like I had, I had terrible credit at the time, it was probably around a 600 or so. Um, it was four points, which is four percentage of the loan origination up front at 12% a year. So you're talking about if you were in that deal for a full year, my expense for the loan would have been 16%. Um, so of course, once again, making sure that you're prices were good was crucial, okay? Um, with time, their, their parameters started to evolve as, as well as the competitors in the field. Um, and then it started to improve where I would get lower points with more deals that I did with them. So it would go from four to three, then three to two and a half, and then progressive. And then also the interest rate on an annualized basis was coming down too. I would go from 12 to 11 to 10.5, 10.25, 10, et cetera. Now they're at a point where their current lending parameters are, they'll lend up to 75% of the ARV and they have a zero point program. So you could do zero points, no, no percentage points for loan origination at anywhere between 10 and 12%, depending on your experience. Or you could do like a two and 8.5% or even I think they even have a two and 8% deal. And those are for quicker, um, transactions where you know, depending on well, longer transactions where you might be in for a little more time. The zero point and 1% is perfect for Burr strategies. You're in and out of a deal in three months, you're only paying 3%, right? Meanwhile, if I was in the deal for three or four months, the other route, I'm paying two points up front and close to a percent every month, which might end up being more than 3%. 
So those are the options that they're working with now. Another thing that they changed is that they're willing to allow you to only have 10% into the deal. So in that same example before where it was, as long as your 10% is more than $20,000, they want you to be in for at least 20K, right? So if the deal was um, the $130,000 deal that I mentioned before, uh, they would want you to be in for at least 20,000. So they would lend you um, 110,000 to buy, and now they'll lend you up to the 75% mark up to 150, so another $40,000 towards renovations, okay? So the only thing that's sucky about that, which really sucks for you as the lender, I mean, as a borrower, is if they're lending you that much money and you only have 20K in the deal, then you're at 170 plus your fees and everything else, like where are you gonna make a profit? That's, that's just my thinking, where are you gonna make a profit? Unless it's big deals, if you're doing million dollar deals, $2 million flips, those sort of deals, yes, there's gonna be enough meat after it all breaks down that, hey, you know what, this was worth it. But on those little deals, the 200K deals, um, you know, you're not gonna to wanna to be at 75% because you're not gonna make money. Now, another thing that I really like about the guys at ABL is since they are using their own money and they're investing their money, their friends' capital, um, they really care about what's going to happen with the deal. So they're not just in there to lend you money and really not care that your deal is successful because if the deal fails, one, you're not going to be a repeat borrower, right? And the way that loans work is, is obviously servicing the debt and origination. So they don't want to be stuck with a property because you dropped the ball on it. So their, their underwriting process is always going to be done by one of the principals at the company. You're going to speak to the owners and they're gonna vet the deal and, and try to figure out what is good and what is bad about this deal. And depending on who you get, um, really d says a lot as to whether or not they're gonna move forward. Some of the guys are, are more conservative in, in, in approach and some are a little more loose. Um, I'm not gonna say who is who, but um, you'll come to find that out when, when, you're, when you're working with them. But what I would suggest is that you are prepared for the more rigid underwriting parameters and make sure that you know your numbers, make sure that you know your deal, make sure that you know because you're gonna get asked questions like, how close is this to the main road? Um, is there an underground oil tank on site? How close are you to a railroad line? What type of railroad line is it? Is it a commercial route where there might be toxic uh, chemicals being transported nearby? or is it a passenger route? Um, is it considered positive or negative because it's close to uh, a transportation hub? Or is it too close that it's gonna be a disruptive or an eyesore? Um, what's happening in this neighborhood? Is there change, is there positive change? Are, are, are hospitals moving in? Are businesses moving in? Um, what makes this a good deal? What makes this particular property the winner? And what about the renovations? Are you sure that the renovations budget are going to satisfy it? Because I see in the appraisal that there's this issue that I'm concerned with. How much is that going to cost you to fix? Have you worked on this type of uh, renovation before? They're really going to grill you on the, on the deal itself and also test your intelligence. So be prepared for that conversation. And if you're not prepared, you're most likely not going to get funded. They don't, you know, even if the deal is good on paper, if they're not confident that you have the wit and the smarts to really navigate all of the difficulties that come with real estate investing, they're not gonna lend because it's their money that's on the line and the last thing that they want is for you to fail and lose their money. That's just the honest truth. So in working with them over years, I've done dozens of deals with them and they've even saved me from getting into some nightmares or introduced me into areas that were rapidly changing. For instance, I was looking into Newark, New Jersey. I called one of the uh, principals there and I asked him, I was like, oh, since you guys are in Jersey, are you seeing investors moving into Newark and what are you finding? And his advice was stay out of like middle, uh, middle Newark because it's still pretty uh, transitional. It's, it's not, quite appreciating at some of the other areas. And where he saw that there was a lot of activity was in Mount Pleasant, which is like the north side of Newark. 
and Weequahic, which was the south side of Newark that's near Hillside and Union. With that, I ended up finding this house that was bombed out for like $60,000 in Weequahic. And from the time that I purchased the property to the time that I renovated and had it listed, the after repair value for that property went from $220,000 to $300,000 within a year's time because of how much interest and activity there was. So they were spot on with being able to see where money was moving because of the, the patterns of their, of their borrowers. So if a lot of people are coming into a neighborhood and revitalizing that neighborhood, then the prices are gonna start dr getting driven up, um, both from the buy side and the sell side, right? So they have that insight into the local market. They're very active in New York, Connecticut, um, New Jersey, because they're based out of Hoboken, New Jersey, and they're going to be able to give you incredible insights. They've, they've done hundreds, if not thousands of deals at this point in all kinds of areas, and they'll tell you these areas turn over quickly, these areas are really slow. I don't know if they're really doing much with the uh, data to say these neighborhoods are home runs. Um, we'll invest time after time because we're seeing that um, investors are turning over properties quickly and getting really good prices. I just did a survey with them, so I think they're kind of starting to build that data set so that they know which areas are high risk and which areas are, are low risk from a, from a lending and risk management perspective. And maybe they're gonna be able to give that data to borrowers and say, hey, you know what? You might wanna look at this area because we know that this area is hot and there's not that much activity there, so you might wanna turn around and, and start looking there. So I really think that that's also a value add for them. Now, keep in mind that when you're doing a hard money loan, um, you're adding to the overall fees uh, to the deal because there's gonna be mortgage recording fees, mortgage fees, um, increased uh, attorney fees, the loan acquisition fees. So there's gonna be added cost to that. So the deal has to be that much better, right? The price that you pay is gonna dictate everything. So. Um, that's, I would say, the, the, the downer to hard money. The positive is you're able to do more deals, right? You're, you're utilizing leverage. And just like a seesaw, though you're, that's a, a lever mechanism, right? So with less weight, depending on where you put the fulcrum, I'm sorry, I'm getting into physics here, but with, with less weight, you're able to move more based on the positioning of that. So loans work the same way. For 20%, if you had $100,000, you could essentially do, what, uh, $500,000 worth of deals, right? So you don't need $500,000 of cash to do these, these purchases. Also, when you're dealing with REOs, they're looking, that you, they're looking to see if you have cash when you're making your offer or one of these alternative lenders that will allow for renovations and, and to buy these dilapidated properties, right? So that's one of the advantages there. So leverage is, a, is definitely a positive of using hard money. Um, being able to purchase dead and beat up properties is another benefit. If you've already used your FHA 203K program, and if you don't know about that loan program, I'm gonna insert a card here to talk about that. Um, and I'm also gonna link it down below so that you can see what your options are if you're doing your first deal. Um, if this is your second deal, you're not going to be able to use that program anymore. Hard money steps in and allows you to borrow for these type of distressed situations. Um, another bonus, as I mentioned before, just to kind of summarize, is that the hard money lenders are going to have insight into where the activity is. And they're going to be able to give you some advice based on their experience with working with tons of flippers. They hear all the horror stories. They even know which contractors are good or bad because other lenders are using them. So they might be able to, to I mean, borrowers are using them. So they might be able to route you to the right contractor for the area that you're investing in, people who understand the program. Now, they're structured no different than, than the FHA uh, program where the renovations portion is put into an escrow account. There is a uh, appraiser or an inspector assigned to your deal and you're gonna have like release milestones and you tell them in advance that we're gonna break the money up in this way. It's gonna be one payment at the end or it's gonna be three payments at every third of the way. Um, the more draws, <clears throat> the more expensive your loan is gonna be um, just because you're gonna have to pay a, a per draw fee. It's not, it's like a hundred bucks or 200 bucks, not, nothing crazy. Um, 
But that's pretty much it. Now, if you guys are looking to work with a top grade, really uh, good group of hard money lenders, definitely check out Asset Based Lending. Um, they're awesome. I really like the guys there. They help me get started and they continue to finance my deals. And I really think that the relationship there is good. I'm not getting paid for this plug. This is just a genuine uh, review of what it is that they do, what they've done for me and how hard money works. Now, if you've enjoyed this video and you made it to this point, hit that like button. Tell me what you thought about this video in the comment section below. Is there any questions that you have about hard money? Are there any uh, things that I didn't really touch on that need further explanation? I do do follow up videos, so let me know in the comment section below. And if you're not already a subscriber, please hit that subscription button, turn your notification bell on so that you're alerted of any videos that are to come. And once again, thank you for joining me at ENTP Life. Hopefully you take this information, go out there and get your first deal. Take care.